Once home to countless construction sites, farms and mining areas, they spread to almost every part of the world. Though the time has passed by now, last survivors can still be found all around the globe. And they became the mascot of my channel. While it is difficult to talk about a specific locomotive type or class in the topic of field railways, due to the large number and diversity, I want to give you a quick background about the company who played a major role in the far and wide spread. Orenstein & Koppel, or how it is usually abbreviated, O & K. The company was founded as primarily a trading company in 1876 in Berlin by Benno Orenstein and Arthur Koppel with the intention to bring modern earth moving equipment to Germany. The horse cart was about to be replaced with the modern field railway that had just been developed a year prior by the French engineer Paul de Coeville to help with the overflowing sugarcane harvest on his farm outside of Paris. ONK bought light rails as well as simple sleepers made of steel and assembled them to movable and ready to use lightweight track segments in every way similar to model railway track. Two people were enough to lay the track down or to remove it again later without any preparing earthworks or ballasting necessary. The low rolling resistance in combination with the easy to unload sideways tippers made the field railway or in German Feldbahn even when still drawn by horse way more efficient than the traditional horse cart while also being much cheaper, space saving and in particular easier and quicker to set up than a standard gauge railway would be. But while ONK also offered steam locomotives to go with their track and wagons, these were initially produced by outside manufacturers. It was not until 1892 Benno Orenstein began to manufacture his own locomotives under the name Merkische Lokomotivfabrik, Locomotive Factory of the Mark. And after slow growth in the early years, ONK began to expand nationally as well as internationally at a very fast pace. Their catalog expanded too with semi-permanent and permanent light rail tracks, earthwork equipment like excavators, including bucket chain excavators, and even standard gauge wagons and locomotives, including state railway designs. The majority of locomotives built, however, were the two excellent field railway steam locomotives, with the gauges ranging from 600 mm, pretty much the standard for German field railways, and also the gauge for my models, all the way up to slightly above 1 meter. These locomotives could be as tiny as 10 horsepower machines. More common, however, were the medium power locomotives with the 50 HP machines alone, making up for about 10% of the more than 13,000 steam locomotives O&K ever built. But even the low end machines were designed with comparatively high tractive effort in mind, at the cost of high speeds. Despite the common practice of adapting steam locomotives specifically to a customer's need, and ONK was no exception here, two excellent field railway locomotives were always kept in stock and ready for imminent delivery due to the high demand. My model represents a 13 HP machine and comes in two basic versions. One with the familiar Walshards valve gear, in Germany better known as Heusinger valve gear, and one with a much simpler Lenkersteuerung. ONK's patented valve gear which is a further development of the Marshall valve gear. This simple and rugged patent valve gear is exemplary for the whole locomotive and has a very good reason. You have to know, many early field railway locomotives were based on state railway design practices, which caused a major problem. While on public railways, tracks are generally professionally and carefully laid down, drivers and firemen are well trained, treat the locomotives with care and regular inspections, as well as proper repairs, keep the rolling stock in good condition. On farms, construction zones or mining fields, everywhere where field railway locomotives are usually employed, that is typically very different. Bumpy track, handling errors, coarse repairs and little maintenance are commonplace and have to be withstood by the locomotive. As such, something way more rugged than delicate state railway-like designs was needed. Less frequently used on construction sites, as such usually better treated and therefore quite rare with the patent valve gear however, are the locomotives with three axles. 
As it is often the case with locomotives, more axles don't necessarily indicate a bigger machine, but might rather be hinting at where it is used, as more axles result into a lower weight per axle, making the three axle locomotives perfect for light railways, due to much reduced wear, as well as savings in track building, as lighter track is sufficient. My model has a slightly more powerful boiler nonetheless, with an output of 40 HP. As a downside, however, machines with three axles require larger radius curves. To help with that, the middle axle is usually flangeless, but despite the blind middle driver, the longer wheelbase still makes them less flexible in this regard. But even for very sharp curves, in combination with weak track, ONK has the perfect locomotives to offer. Articulated locomotives, but very tiny ones. Besides the low axle load and the ability to take tight curves, as compound machines of the Malay type, they had another significant advantage over conventional locomotives. While the rear frame, to which boiler cap and bunkers are fitted, features high pressure cylinders, fed with fresh steam directly from the boiler, the steam is then reused in the low pressure cylinders mounted to the articulated frame at the front before being exhausted through the funnel, resulting into a higher tractive effort than a conventional locomotive with the same boiler would have. In case of my model, it's a 13 HP boiler. To help with starting up, however, fresh steam can also be fed directly into the low pressure cylinders, so all four cylinders can start moving simultaneously. While articulated locomotives in general were never a common sight on European standard gauge routes, it's on sharply twisting narrow gauge lines where they could really prove themselves. In particular, the Malay type became quite popular for both public railways and private operators alike, and as such, quite contrast in size to some of the North American duplex locomotives in particular. While field railway locomotives are typically tank engines when runs along, the tracks had infrastructure lacking, or the used fuel source very bulky, the tanks and bunkers on the locomotive are simply not large enough, so a tender has to be added. In difference to bigger machines, the locomotive itself is barely altered to accommodate the tender. A cutter in the rear of the cab to allow access, as well as a special coupling between locomotive and tender, is all that's needed. As such it was quite easy in common practice to turn an existing tank locomotive into a tender engine later on, whenever it was required. Various further wheel arrangements and designs were of course also built over the years to serve specific needs. Too many to introduce them all in one video, however. As small and simple machines, the Field Railway steam locomotives by Urenstein and Koppel had a long career and were still in use after more efficient diesel locomotives came along. While most would eventually be replaced by roadside vehicles, for some uses, field railways are still the better option, in particular in the peat and sugarcane industries. In regards to the later one, in particular the island Java, is renowned to be one of the last places where German field railway steam locomotives could be seen in regular service, and occasionally some of them can still be seen today. And countless more examples survive as either static displays or in working condition on heritage railways all over the world. While sometimes overlooked, these small, but due to their number very powerful locomotives, left their footprint, or rather wheel print, in transportation history. This was a difficult script to write due to the complexity of the topic, but I hope I could give you an informative introduction into this fascinating subject nonetheless, and finally introduce you to my, um, heraldic locomotive, if you like. Thank you for joining me, and let me know what you think of these tiny but mighty locomotives. And a mighty thank you goes also to my channel members, Dave Heise, Flip Schwib, Kay Frankly, and Lukas Ilskens, for helping me to continue to recreate railway history in Blender. See you in my next video! Here it's Steel Bridge Models.